bless you all this morning. Wonderful day that the Lord has given to us in the beautiful colors. Enjoy his presence here this morning. Amen. So let us all stand and we'll open our service with a word of prayer and invite him into our midst this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we truly do pray, Lord, that we have brought you here with us this morning, Lord. And Lord, we want to make you feel welcome, Father. And Lord, to be able to speak to our hearts this morning with your word and Lord, to worship you in spirit and truth and to sing some songs of praise to you, Father. And Lord, we just look forward to the day that you would call us home, Father. And Lord, we know that as we see the day approaching, we'd gather ourselves together more often, Father. And Lord, as support for each other, and Lord, that we would be able to be a whole body, Lord, that you would call home, Father. And Lord, we just appreciate the chance to be here with you this morning. Be with us this here gathered in this building today, Father, and those that may be tuned in, Father, and watching from afar off, Lord, we know that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever, and so that means you're the same here as you would be there, Father. So, Lord, we just pray for your mercy to us this morning, Father, and your blessings, and we ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. You got your own the Believe book? Let's sing number 138, The Solid Rock. <clears throat> My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Sorry. I guess we'll start over. She said I was in the wrong key. <laughs> My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood supports me in the welling flood. When all around my soul gives way, within is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. Dreadless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Number 369. I'll fly away. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. Oh, I'll fly away, oh glory. Hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. When the shadow 
shadows of this life have grown out fly away like a bird from prison bars has flown out fly away oh I fly away oh glory I fly away when I die hallelujah by and by Just a few more weary days and then I fly away to a land where joy shall never end. I fly away, oh I fly away, oh glory, I fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Amen. Looking for that flight, amen. Don't be late to the gate. Amen. This time we'll take our prayer request before the Lord. Does anyone have one they'd like to make known? <clears throat> amen. Our readers, I, I, I've uh, pretty much come to a point in my life where I can't ride, uh, read cursive anymore, <laughs> unless it's typed, but I'll do my best. Uh, it says, remember, uh, please pray for Daniel, I don't know the last name, Mel's, a friend from of the Shear family grew up in this message, but seeking the truth of this word and spirit, uh, specifically asked that this church grace... Uh, tabernacle please pray for God's will in his life amen and we should seek that every day we wake up amen something that we can do for him or or which direction he'd have us to go amen and then amen well it's not too late yet we, we do believe God's mercy is still here with us and we don't want to miss that chance because once it's gone it, it'd be too late and uh, also for Suzanne Shear for uh, Oh, looking for medical. Okay. All right. And uh, glad she made it out there. Okay. Remember her in prayer that God would help her out with finding the medical care that she may need and and uh, that God's in everything. And uh, also continue to remember Brother Bill Caldwell out in Oregon for prayers. He continues to get a little older in the Lord. And then uh, also for, I know, uh, Lots of folks to be traveling to India in this uh, November month. So remember, you know, you're going too. So we'll remember you in prayer that God would uh, keep you safe and that you'd have a good time. I sure enjoyed uh, Rhoda's family while they were here. And and uh, I told her to take some pictures back of, of the finished house because uh, her dad was uh, just all over on the ladder and tearing stuff off. He was, he was sure a lot of fun and a wonderful brother to have visit. And then also for Brother uh, Brian, I don't know if he's made plans to go or not, but continue to remember that in prayer. Then Brother Mark uh, Bailey and his family in South Africa this morning. And all our unspoken prayer requests can be known by an uplifted hand, and we'll go to the Lord with prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we truly do seek you in everything that we have in our lives, Lord, the decisions that we make and the steps that we take. Father, we always look for your guiding hand lord and the footsteps that we can follow lord that you've given to us father and so lord for these requests that we've mentioned to you this morning father for those that are seeking you spiritually father and the truth in your word lord that is uh, seems hard to some people that that don't have your spirit father and don't have a revelation but once you do come in to us father and show us the way it it's just as plain as the nose on our face father and lord we do appreciate the revelation that you've given to us lord and Lord, we know we won't know everything when we're here on earth, Father, but we grow a little bit closer to you each time we meet, Father, and to hear your word. And for Suzanne Shear, Lord, and her medical uh, situation, Father, and the care, Lord, that she may look for, Lord, we pray that you're in all things. And Lord, for those that are going to be traveling this month, Lord, as those that are going to go overseas, Lord, for Thanksgiving, and those that may be traveling, Father, down, Lord, we pray that you would keep each person safe, Lord, and 
in, in the palm of your hand, Father, and that your protective angels would always be around them, Father. And Lord, we look forward to what you'd have for us in your word this, Lord, this morning, Father. We know missing a Wednesday, Lord, so we can have two services on Sunday. We sure come hungry, Father, Lord. So we pray, Lord, that you would feed our soul this morning, Lord, and help us, Lord, to enlighten your word to us, Lord, and may the things that we don't know about, Lord, become more clear. Lord, keep us close, Father, that we won't miss that call when you call us home, Father. And Lord, we appreciate the answered prayers, Lord, this morning that you've given to us, Father, and for the healing in our bodies, and Lord, for those that may have been sick, Lord, that are now feeling better, Lord, we know that there's nothing, Lord, that is done that you hadn't done, Father. So, Lord, we thank you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> Uh, if uh, Brother Steve and uh, if you'd give him a hand this morning, I am drawing a blank, Brother Don. <laughs> Amen. Brother Steve, if you would ask the Lord's blessing this morning. Amen. Number 169, wonderful. <clears throat> oh, my heart sings today, sings for joy and gladness. Jesus saves, satisfies, banishes my sadness. Guilt is gone, peace is mine, peace like to a river. Jesus is wonderful and mighty to deliver. Wonderful, wonderful, Jesus is to me. Counselor, Prince of Peace, the mighty God is he. Saving me, keeping me from all sin and shame. Wonderful is my Redeemer, praise his name. Once a slave, now I'm free, free from condemnation. Jesus gives liberty and the full salvation. Now the sin of the past have all been forgiven. And my name is inscribed on that book of heaven. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus is to me. Counselor, Prince of Peace, the mighty God is he. Saving me, keeping me from all sin and shame. Wonderful is my Redeemer, praise His name. Living here with my Lord in the Holy Union. Day by day, all the way, holding sweet communion. Oh, what change grace hath wrought in my lowly station. Since my soul has received full and free salvation. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus is to me. Counselor, Prince of Peace, the mighty God is He, saving me, keeping me from all sin and shame. Wonderful is my Redeemer, praise His name. Amen. Let's just sing that song, uh, number 577, I'm sorry, 575, Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Oh, Master, Savior, Jesus. Like a fragrance after the rain. Oh, Jesus, 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 let all heaven. 
heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. Oh, Jesus, 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 there's something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like a fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 where heaven and earth proclaim the kings and kingdoms will all pass away but there's something about that name amen god bless you this morning let us all stand and we'd sing only believe as we ask for the Brian to come. Only believe. Only believe. All things are possible. Only Only believe, Jesus, you're here, Jesus, you're here, all things are possible now that you're here, Jesus, you're here. You're here, and all things are possible now that you're here. Let us bow our heads in prayer. <clears throat> Gracious Father, we're so thankful, Lord, to have this privilege once again. Lord, knowing not how long, Father, it'll be till we go home, but yet knowing that we're sitting on this side of Jordan waiting. Oh, Lord, to cross over. <clears throat> and just as Israel, Father, waited to cross over, Lord, oh, God, you tested them. And so, Father, we know that the times of testings are upon us. And so, Father, we just pray that you help us, oh, God, to know the end from the beginning, keep our eyes focused for knowing that we're ordained to pass these tests. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> Now this morning we're going to look at paragraph 93 and 94 of Brother Bram's sermon, The Unveiling of God, where he's speaking of God vindicating the message and the messenger that he, that he has sent with his message. And never forget that it was the Lord himself that descended with the shout, which is the message. <coughs> Excuse me. Now he said, now Moses, you understand, the, the, you understand, and the people understands now. So in other words, Moses understood first and the people understood. I said, see, I have showed you and I have vindicated you. Now he's talking, Brother Bram is actually quoting God here, or he's quoting what God said to Moses. God had veiled himself in this prophet to speak his word to the people. Moses was the living God to them. The living word of God made manifest. That's the reason his face was veiled, see? And, and do you know the same thing in a genuine Christian is veiled today to unbelievers? So I'm saying in the way that the prophet was veiled to the people, you as Christians are veiled to unbelievers. They see, the, they see them women with their long hair and, and things, and they say, well, look at that old model. <laughs> women twist their hair up on, uh, uh, up on the back and say, got a flat tire, spare tire, see? It's all veiled. They're blind. 
Well, they say, well, I got a PhD. I don't care what you got. You're still ignorant of the word. Exactly right. Oh, that, that's just something minor. Take the, they take the small lessons first. So he's kind of going back and forth with their arguments and then, of course, the word arguments. 94. How about the people who say that they are veiled in the presence of God and preach some church tradition? <coughs> oh, mercy goodness. Which adds to and takes from and everything else. Like injecting their own subjects and their own thoughts and not the word of God. See, what kind of a veil? That's got an ecclesiastical veil. God tore that veil wide open. Well, they say there's no such a thing as prophets. There's no such a thing in these last days as apostles and prophets. There's no such a thing as divine healing. There's no such a thing as seers anymore. There's no such a thing as Mark 16 being fulfilled. Apostolic age is gone or is done. They veiled it from the people. But God walked right out with the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit of fire and rent that thing from the top to bottom. God has rent the veil. Now, in Proverbs, I want to talk about the veil because... The veil has to be something special to hide. You know, if it was just a very clear veil, then, of course, it wouldn't hide anything. <clears throat> In Proverbs 26 and 6 says, He that sendeth a message by the hand of a fool cutteth off the feet and, drink, and drinketh damage. So this veil or this messenger <coughs> is nobody's fool. All right. This morning we're going to continue with our thoughts and vindication that we spoke in last week, but... We're going to focus more on the vindicated message itself rather than the messenger uh, and, and, the, and the vindicated message for this third exodus. Now last week we examined vindication, not so much God vindicating the man himself, but the message of thus saith the Lord that God gave him to speak in his name. And since the man and his message are one, then we can also see the backing up of that word also backs up uh, that the messenger was indeed sent by God. We also know that if God sends a man, then God fully equips that man for the message that he brings to him. Now this morning we're going to examine the message that was brought at each exodus wherein God himself accompanied that messenger and was the focus of the message itself. For every time that God uh, has come in each of the three exoduses, it has been to bring a message of deliverance. Therefore this morning we're going to look at the characteristics of each message that God brought with his presence for each of the three exoduses. Now, the first thing that God does at each exodus is God comes down, of course. His presence comes down to visit a man, and he makes his presence known first to that prophet. <laughs> and then through that prophet, God makes his presence known to the rest of the people that God has come to deal with. In the first exodus, we see that God gave the prophet Moses a message that he has come to deliver his people from bondage. We see first in the scripture in Exodus 9 and 1, Then the Lord said unto Moses, go, into, go in unto Pharaoh and tell him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. So God came down to deliver. After God identifies his presence with his prophet, then we see how God deals with the prophet and commissions him to bring forth a message, and in doing so, God promises to be with the mouth of that prophet. In Exodus 4 and 5, we read, And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in, it, in, in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth and I will teach you what you shall say so he's telling Moses look I'm going to be with your mouth but I'm, I want you to put the words in Aaron's mouth as well which I believe Aaron representing the fivefold ministry so we take our sermons from the mouth of the prophet and we take them back to the scripture <clears throat> so you see Moses did not think that he was qualified because he was not a polished speaker but God let him know who made his mouth you see if God calls you then you should not worry about such trivial matters as whether you can speak well or not. God will use those who he chooses, and he will equip them for the ministry. In Exodus 4.11 we read, And God said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or the deaf, or seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Because what God really wants in the man, uh, in the man of his choosing, is not an ability to speak, but an ability to just shut up and listen. An ability to just surrender yourself to him in everything that you do and everything you say. In Deuteronomy 18 and 18 we read, And I will raise him up, a prophet from among the brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And so we see, we see in that, God promised Moses that he's going to be with his mouth. Now, here's the thing. Moses begs God, he says, you know, I, I'm, I'm not very good with my mouth, I'm not very eloquent, and these kind of things. God said, look, who made your mouth? You know, God didn't want someone who was polished, someone who could get up there and just go on and on about, uh, <clears throat> you know, just uh, enticing words of man's wisdom. 
Uh, I don't know, how many of you ever read the uh, autobiography of, uh, or not the autobiography, the biography of, um, of uh, West John Wesley? Anybody? I've got it in my study if you'd like to borrow sometime. Um, the man that writes it, or he, uh, he actually interviews people that were attended John Wesley's meetings and also uh, George Whitfield. And he said George Whitfield was a very eloquent speaker. He could get up there and he could really entice the people with his words and draw them into his subject. And uh, he, would, he, was, he said he's quite an actor. And so he said, you know, when he's getting people ready for the altar, you know, he'd say, Hark! I hear the angels, you know, and just all this drama. And he'd just draw the people in. But he said, but you know, he said, I, I felt like while I was listening to him, uh, he's such an eloquent speaker that uh, I could build a ship from stem to stern. But to do anything for my soul, there was nothing there. He said, on the other hand, John Wesley. John Wesley came in kind of halting and, you know, just, and, uh, but he said those little beady eyes, he said he put that, you know, he, John Wesley had that hairdo, you know, he had those, he put that hair back. I remember Brother Vale doing that, you know, he had that hair. You look, you look you right in the eye. He said those beady eyes just pierce a hole right through your soul. He said, and, and, and God fed your soul. You felt like he was speaking directly to you. But, see, but God doesn't want the man that's all polished and everything else. He wants the man that's real. The man that's genuine. All right? The man that can listen. And so we see God make promises that he would be with Moses' mouth. Exodus 4 and 12. Now therefore go and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. Now I will teach you what thou shalt say. You know, Brother Branham walking through the woods. Looks at a cigarette package. He would never touch it, but he said, you know, something drew me to it, and I, I, I thought, there's a message. I, I picked it up and said, I think he man's filter. See, so then God began to deal with him from that little cigarette package. He said, now, if a man was even thinking, he wouldn't smoke those things. But he began to draw us to the word, a thinking man's filter, God's word. So God taught him, God, he, and God says, now, therefore, go, and I will be with thy mouth, and I will teach thee what to say. <clears throat> now, in a sermon escape, hither it come quickly, Brother Brown tells us, God's message has always been a message of deliverance before judgment. Noah had deliverance, Lot, Lot had deliverance, and though it was a message of deliverance, the people turns it down. It's mercy and deliverance, and the people turns it down, except for the elect. Not a big church here. Worldwide, the bride is not very many. But she's one who listens. She's one who pays attention to the voice, to the, to the message of deliverance, because we know the judgment's coming. The whole world knows the judgment's coming. But what are they doing about it? They're trying to do something in their own might. Now, there's something here I want to point out. Many people follow certain ministers because of their ability to expound the word. And many people follow a minister because of the way in which a minister expounds the word. When the minister gets excited, they get excited. And since people like to get excited, they seek out ministers that will help them to get excited. But the word is what should excite. Not our ability to present it, nor our emotions when, uh, that we use when doing so. I remember certain years ago, a certain young minister I was mentoring at the time was preaching at a certain church not so far from here. And I went to visit him between services, and he was very frustrated. He said, Brother Brown, I can't even hear myself preach at that church. And when, I make, when I make a point, the people are so loud that I can't even hear myself preach. And I said, well, brother, the reason they are excited is because you are excited. They are just following what you're doing. I said, you get wound up, and they get wound up. You get loud, and they get loud. They're just following what you're doing. I said, if you want them to understand what you're telling them, then don't preach tonight. Teach. Hold down your emotions and just teach them. Just say it uh, to them without getting so wound up yourself. And so when, <clears throat> then he, 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 uh, we talked about the presence and some of the other things that he wanted to teach on that, that evening, and then we went over to the church. Well, that night he got up there and he just taught the people what he wanted them to understand, and it was, so, it was just very quiet in the church. You could almost hear a pin drop. But the people actually were listening and beginning to think about what they were being taught, and his service was very successful that night. So sometimes 
We are our biggest enemy <clears throat> when it comes to trying to echo the message because instead of just echoing it, we add our own zeal or we add our own sarcasm or we add our own feelings and that is when we get too much of ourselves in the way and water down the message that God gave us to echo. So God had to choose out a man who would not place the emphasis on his own abilities or feelings or emotions concerning the message God gave him to say. That's why God used Brother Branham and he didn't use Lee Vale. Lee was a great intellect, a great teacher. But he couldn't get himself out of the way like Brother Bram could get himself out of the way. Now, I'm not saying that to criticize Brother Vail. I'm the same way. That's why he didn't use me. All right? God chose out a man and equipped that man to say just what he said, just the way that he said it. And that, my friends, is what a perfect echo is. To say it the same way, with the same emotion, the same inflection, the same energy, and the same dynamic. Now, I've often given you the example of two young men speaking to one another, and one says, well, look at that woman. She's beautiful. And in writing, you see that I place an exclamation point after what he said to give those words the emphasis behind them that the young man really meant what he said. <clears throat> But all you have to do is take that exclamation point and, and, and just put a little hook on it. It becomes a question mark. And so the very same words, look at that woman. She's beautiful. That throws a complete 180 degree because what? A little, a little. Whoosh. And how many preachers have you heard over your years? It looks like they're preaching a beautiful sermon. And at the very end, there's a whoosh, little hook. Throws a question mark in it. That's exactly what Satan used. He said, God, didn't, God, God said, thou shalt surely die. Thou shalt surely die. She said, you know, the day we eat, that's the day we'll die. He said, well, not. Question mark. Now, notice how one little jot, a little tittle, and we have the same words, but meaning totally the opposite of what the other said. So God had to choose a man who would repeat what he said in the same way that he said it. And that is why he told Moses, don't worry about your own abilities to speak. That is not why I chose you. I'll be with your mouth. Now remember he told us in the last quote that God sends a message of mercy, but the people turned it down. Why? Because he presented it the way that God wanted him to present it. Now remember, when Jesus came, the Bible said he'd be in no form and no shape and comeliness that we'd have a desire of him. The man of sorrows acquainted with grief. The people wanted a king. They wanted a Saul. They wanted a big man. And God didn't send him that. God sent him humility. Because God himself is humble. Had Moses been a great orator, he could have used words to, to work up the people into a frenzy. And they would have been climbing all over each other to receive and accept what that message was that he brought. But God didn't send a man who was eloquent in speech. He sent a man who had herded sheep for the past 40 years and had been so stripped of his human pride that he was not going to do anything beyond what God told him word by word what to do and what to say because that's exactly the way you handle sheep. <clears throat> I remember years and years ago teaching on sheep. And I was just, uh, I wasn't even married yet, so I was 25 years old. And I was teaching at a... Uh, on a, on a Saturday afternoon, I had a ministry once a month. We go to the retirement home, and uh, and I was just teaching on sheep, and uh, reading quotes from Brother Branham, you know, about how a sheep would walk down a, a road, and if he decided to take a left and then and then take a right and continue, the sheep would all go down with no gate there or nothing, just go down. They take a left, take a right. They just do exactly what the sheep did, and that's because they're sheep. And Moses spent forty years. Now, now listen. How many of you have ever been around sheep? Anybody? Okay. After clearing out your nose, because that's about, it's one of the smelliest things you'll ever smell. I think uh, Christina had to stay on a sheep farm for her wedding uh, in England, and uh, not a good thing. Forty years. Forty years with nobody but sheep around you. If that doesn't humble a person, I don't know what will. He went from a type A, type 1, go, 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 always plotting, planning, building, executive of executives, running the whole 
country, all the building projects of Egypt, to where he's doing nothing. Hurting sheep. You don't hurt sheep. You sit with them. You talk with them. You walk with them. They walk with you. You're just looking over them, protecting them. That's it. So I'm sure that over 40 years, all of that drive, all of that type A, all of that type 1, whatever you want to call it, personality complex was gone. <coughs> God has stripped him of his human pride and basically he began to think like a sheep, act like a sheep. I imagine he talked like a sheep, smelled like a sheep, you name it. You know, we see the same thing concerning Jesus. In John 14, 31, but that, that the world may know that I love the Father as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise and let us go hence. No big plans. Just do what the Father said. That's where we as Christians make our mistake. We, we got to do this and that and the other. We can't learn to just sit. It's hard. Right, Gary? Peter, you're learning. It's been very difficult, I'm sure. Steve, you're, you're, you're really getting there, I think. Uh, John 15, 10. If you keep my commandment, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. John 12, 49. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say what I should speak. <clears throat> you know, kind of reminds me of when I was a young boy, thinking about my grandfather the other day, and uh, I was talking to my father's uh, uh, sister, and uh, they used to have a saying, Merch I.S., kind of a bo uh, bohemian saying, and it meant children keep still and eat. We were taught children should be seen and not hurt. And, you know, over the ages, we look at today, that's all you hear is kids anymore. You know, kids are kind of taking over everything. <clears throat> but kids don't learn anything when they're just doing all the talking. If kids would sit at the feet with the parents, if the parents are discussing, they can sit and listen. They'll learn. And Jesus was the eldest son, the pattern. And he said, he gave me a commandment, what I should say, what I should speak. And then he goes on to say, whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. You see, he didn't have his mind filled with just everything in the world. Like Abraham Lincoln. Two books, the Bible. And then I think it was the history of American civilization, or history of, of, of human civilization, something like that, something like that. history of America. <coughs> What's that? That was one of them too, but there was another one that I read in his, uh, in his uh, biography. Here's the thing, he didn't fill his mind with all kinds of things like the children do today. You know, even men like Steve Jobs would not allow his nephews to, to to sit in front of a, uh, one of these, uh, you know, things that we have today. People use them to babysit. Back in the 80s, it was, a, they just put them before a, a video. That's kids babysit. Today, it's give them a little box. Kids, they're out of your hands. You can have your conversation. But watch your kids sometime. Take all that stuff away. Give them a spoon and a... He'll go out, he'll dig a hole. Give him a little truck, one truck, not ten trucks, just one truck. He doesn't need ten trucks. Give him one truck and he'll be sitting by that hole. Filling the truck up, dumping it over here, filling it up, dumping it over there. His little mind is working. Sometimes I wonder if the way that we 
are so pressed, everything's pressed today. Like Brother Brown said, in, in uh, John Wesley's day, his, his wife had, what, 13 children? And, you know, they'd go out in the field and they'd be, you know, harvesting. And basically, they just have the baby right there, continue harvesting. Wrap them in a, in a, in a like a, a towel, throw them over their back, you know, just tie them to their back. I've seen them in Bolivia, same way. He said they didn't have dishwashers for the mothers, you know, but you've all heard Brother Bram talk about those things, but today they have dishwashers and everything else, they don't have any time. What do you want your time for? That's the, that's the thing. What is your time for? <coughs> what are we living for? Are we living to get ready to go home? Do you realize that we're within days, like Israel was? Israel was four days from going home. Four days, and God gave them their test, and they failed it. So they wandered 40 more years. We're within days, brother, sister, and I wonder if, if we aren't in that 40-year wandering now because we weren't ready to go over. In a sermon, Queen of Sheba, brother Brown said, "Now look what happened when Jesus." was God's message to the people. And they rejected it. Look what happened to the people that rejected it. <clears throat> now remember, God did not send them a son, a son of God that was head and shoulders above the people. And that was so gifted as, as a speaker that he could make them believe what he wanted them to believe. God doesn't use slick willies. He uses men who are truly humble because they truly understand in God's presence they are nothing. They understand the sovereignty of God. Now from a sermon, God who is rich in mercy, Brother Branham said, now God always likens his prophets to eagles. And what was it? Moses was his messenger. And they were following Moses and that was the, that was the eagle's wings that they was carried on because he was packing God's message. And the people followed that. They were following God as they followed Moses with his message of deliverance. And the Bible said that they perished not with them who believed not. Because God was rich in mercy to them because they were following his commandment. God wants us to follow his commandment. So you have <laughs> two million people come out and all but two perish. But the two that didn't perish, study them sometime. Notice their whole focus was on the promise. Not on what they saw when they got over there. It was on the promise and the promise alone. Not in circumstances. <clears throat> now, I remember one time in 1981, 82, I was down in Texas preaching at Brother Bell's church in Beaumont, Texas, when they were still in the old church there. And I was preaching on false anointed ones at the end time, and I was using Brother Bell's notes where he had uh, preached the same, inspire, uh, same thing that had inspired Brother Branham. And I had, been, I had this experience where I was teaching. While I was teaching, I could feel a rejection in the church of what I was teaching. And so I just continued right on teaching it anyway. And at first I just felt a rejection in my spirit. But as I continued preaching, I could see it was coming from the left side. And then in the middle of the left side, and finally, toward, I, I, I finally it came down to there a certain woman in the church, middle-aged, had a big Beaumont bouffant. Now, that could be anybody in that church. Because they all had big Beaumont bouffants at that time anyway. I don't know what they do today. But, <laughs> well, when I got home, I told to Brother Vail what I was what, what took place. I told him that regardless of what was going on, regardless of feeling that rejection, I didn't change the way I was preaching. I just kind of monotone, just kind of just went through and laid it out. And he said, and Brother Vail said, he said, that's good. He said, you should preach as monotone as possible. Because when a minister gets excited, the people get excited. And 99% of the time, the people are not excited because of what the word is saying. They are excited because the preacher is excited and our excitement should come from the word, not from the preacher. And so you see, God had to choose a person who was going to echo his word just exactly the way God said it. And so he took 40 years and he humbled Moses down to the place where he spent 24-7, 365 days a year with sheep until the man Moses became a sheep in the presence of God. No self-pride, no self-assurance, no opinion of self, just dead to self. And so Moses, when he came into the presence of the Lord, he came in very gingerly. He took off his shoes. And from a sermon influence, Brother Brown said, Now don't you see what the presence of the Lord does to real believers? 
We don't even want to confess. We just want to say, well, we're Pentecostal, we're Baptist, we're, Pente we're, we're Presbyterians, and, and live on. But a real, genuine, called servant of God humbles himself in the presence of God. He doesn't criticize it. Look, look who criticized the Lord Jesus was the Pharisees, the sectarianism. They were the ones who criticized him. But the man who was really willing to be a servant humbled himself and went into action. She said, you'll follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. When he saw that, that really was God, he went into action. <clears throat> Maybe it's just age, okay? But most of your men are my age or older. But there's a, something happening. And it's a, it's a pull of the hour. It's like Brother Don said, it's an unpacking. Finding that all these things that you thought you'd like to have don't really mean nothing to you. You don't use them when you get them anyway. Spend time with your grandkids, that means more to you than all the gadgets. I think that's the way it's going to be in the millennium. And I think that's millennium fever. Just unpacking. You sit in front of a lake, sit and watch the trees, watch the leaves come down like rain. And you're just in awe of God's presence and his word. <clears throat> Notice Brother Brown says he, he was just a humble man. Moses, 40 years with the sheep. Just a humble man. From why it had to be shepherds, he said, and I want, I want you to see that it was not the message itself that attracted the people, but the miracles. Notice he says, now notice, he was sent to his, his brethren in slavery, under bondage, with a message of deliverance, with a God-given sign to prove his claim. Israel went for his message. They believed it, every one of them, but in the evening time, and then notice here, Brother Bram corrects himself to let us know it was not the message that Israel went after, but the miracles. He said they went for his miracles, but in the evening time, when he gave his message, it was different. All that did not believe the me that message died. That's right. What was the message? The message was, was of the coming judgment. At the evening time, God went out through the camp of Israel to find if the people had believed his shepherd's prophet's message, <coughs> and all had not believed it, perished. <coughs> Remember, he came on with a gangbuster. Let my people go, Pharaoh. You know, and, and, and if you don't, he put his rod into water, and the waters turned to red, to blood. Spoke, flies came, spoke, frog came, spoke, fleas came. <clears throat> One thing after another, after another, after another, the people were just sitting back and mesmerized by that. But one day God turned it on them as well. See, all these things didn't happen to Goshen. But one day God turned to them also and said, The firstborn that doesn't have the token applied in your home, the firstborn is going to die. Now Israel, if they were just paying to the miracles, they might have missed it. <clears throat> but if the miracles said, hey, God is with this man, we better listen to what he says. Then they put that blood on the post <clears throat> and they didn't perish. And so we see that the message has always been the same, a message of deliverance before judgment. Now from his sermon, escape, come hither, come quickly. And every time the messenger that went forth brought a message of love and grace and deliverance, God's message has always been a message of deliverance before judgment. Noah had deliverance. Lot had deliverance. And though it was a message of deliverance, the people turns it down. <coughs> it's mercy and deliverance, and the people turn it down. Why would we do that? As a people, why would the people turn down the mercy of God, the deliverance? <clears throat> he said also the same thing in a sermon called, called out. He said, let us see what taking place in the days of the coming of the destruction and judgments in the days of Noah <coughs> and the days of Lot. <coughs> they are both <coughs> affiliated with the third destruction. <coughs> Jesus, as it was, as it were in those days, so will it be when the Son of Man comes the second time. It'll be just like it was then. And we're taught that in the days of Noah, <coughs> not only at that time, but in the days of Lot, uh, as junction time, 
And every time before judgment come to the earth, God sends mercy. Call. Uh, we, there's a bottle of water inside the. Uh, I have some. But could you bring? There's a bottle of water on my desk. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Sometimes you take these cough drops and you just dry out, and you can't swallow. <coughs> and then you get that tickle twice as <coughs> bad. They were both affiliated with the third destruction. Jesus said, as it was in those days, so will it be when the Son of Man, the second time, comes second time. It'll be just like it was then. And we're taught that in the days of Noah, and not only at that time, but in the days of Lot, as a juncture time, and every time before judgment comes to the earth, God sends mercy. Uh, God sends his mercy call. Uh, just before the days of the antediluvian destruction, God sent a prophet to the earth, Enoch, and he, and he sent a, an angel, and he sent a message. Uh, he did the supernatural, but what did, he do? What, what did man do? They ate, they drank, they planted, they built it. They, they rejected the call of the message, though the message that each of, of those men, both Lot and Noah, their message consisted of this, grace, mercy, and deliverance. Grace, God's mercy to the people was presented through grace, and deliverance was presented to the people, but they turned it down. <clears throat> now, in, in examining the second exodus, we see that God gives his prophet a message, and the message is not his own message, but God's message that he brings to the people. From his sermon, the spoken words original seed, Brother Brown said, Now, God's messengers have always been rejected. You believe that? Moses was rejected, is that right? Jesus was rejected, and Luke said in 10, 16, if you want to write that down, all right, rejected. First Samuel 8 and 7, God's message was rejected. <coughs> God had a messenger, a prophet, called Samuel, you believe it, rejected him and his message, he took the world. This is the law of God. This is going, and I don't know whether to say this or not, but this is the law of God. God's law is to receive a vindicated servant. Let's just prove that for just a minute. I want you to take one of the scriptures here, John 13 and 20. <clears throat> Let's just see. I got something wrote down here and just kind of and get in my mind here. Oh yeah, here you are. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receives whosoever I send receives me, and he that receives me receives him that sent me. A vindicated servant. Oh brother, there's a thousand sermons laying right there. That's right. It's the law of God. Receive it. All right. <clears throat> now, Notice, even the Son of God was of such a nature that he, he knew when to speak and when not to speak, and he only spoke when God told him to speak. In Matthew 7, 15, While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out, uh, out of the clouds which said, This is my beloved Son, in which I am well pleased to hear ye him. In Acts 7, 37, we read, this is, what Moses, what, what, this is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto him, him shall you hear. Acts 3 and 22, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. In uh, John 12, 49, for I, for I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak, and I know that this commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak now. <clears throat> now notice his attitude. Okay, the words of my Father spoke, it's life everlasting. So that's all I'm going to speak. It's life everlasting. Can we do the same? <clears throat> then said Jesus unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. John 7, 16. Jesus answered and said unto them, My doctrine is not mine, but his attend me. If any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak it of myself. John 10, 31. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him, and Jesus answering them said, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. From, for which of these works do you stone me? In other words, look. God vindicates everything I say, so which of the vindication are, are, are you going to stone me for? And the Jews answered and said, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. Now the men would say, Well, Brother Bram, when it comes to the pulpit, you know, every time it, you know, that thus saith the Lord goes forth, it's perfect. Those visions never fail, but don't listen to his doctrine. You see, there's something wrong. 
And there was something wrong with the Jews. For a good work we stole thee not, but for blasphemy. It's not what you do, it's what you say. And because thou, being a man, makest thyself God, Jesus answering them said, it is, not is it not written in your law, I have said that you are gods? If you call them gods, whom unto the word of the Lord came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say of him whom the, the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. <clears throat> but if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me, and I in him. And therefore they sought again to take him, take him, but he escaped out of their hand. Okay, so now we examine in the third exodus that God has given us a prophet as well. He's given us a prophet, he's given us a message, he's given us a pillar of fire to vindicate. Just the same as he was with Jesus, same as he was with Moses. And that message has one purpose, and that is to deliver the people from bondage. Now remember, Jesus, he said, the truth shall make you free. They said, oh, we're free. What do you mean? We're in bondage. We're, we're free people. He said, no, you're, you're, you're bound to your traditions. You're bound to your creeds. You're bound to your church idiosyncrasies. People are still bound today. From leadership, he said, in any man's message that comes in, a genuine born message of God is different from the old trend. When a divine healing went forth not so long ago, did you notice how the impersonators followed it? See? And every one of them went right in, in them organization staying there. Does anyone know that there had to be a message follow that? Why? God don't entertain us. He attracts our attention with something, and then, and when he attracts our attention, then he's got his message. Look, when he first came to the earth and started his ministry, a young rabbi, we want you over here, and, and, and we want you over here, and <clears throat> come on down here, and the young, the young prophet, oh, we want you over here, come here. But one day he stood up and he said, I and my father are one. Oh, oh my. He makes himself God. Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Oh, he's a vampire. Well, we have nothing to do with that. Them apostles sat right there, thousands left him, but those apostles were ordained to life. He said so. They, they, they couldn't explain it. They believed it. They stayed right with it because he said no man could, see, uh, could do these works. Now you know the world is now beginning to embrace the ministry of William Branham. Not the message, Derek, that thing you sent me. People are embracing the man. Not the message. Brother Derek sent me a video to watch this week where some woman preacher was really touting Brother Branham and the miracle. And, I mean, everything she said was right. You know, she's she pointing out the, you know, the, 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 the great miracles, uh, people that, had, did, you know, had limbs that had been missing, grown back, uh, eyes that they didn't have in their sockets grew back, or grew that weren't there. But did you notice the message she got from it? And we're going to do that too. I could tell they had no clue about the message because they kept saying the miracles that he did. And I've news for you, he didn't do one miracle. They kept saying, he healed this person, he, he healed this person, and he, Brother Brown didn't heal anybody. They had no clue that God alone is a healer. I am the Lord that healeth all thy diseases, and there is no other. Amen. I'm sorry, there's no other. It wasn't power that William Bram had. He had no power. Pretty good eyesight. Could shoot a rifle pretty well. But no power to heal. <clears throat> and so when your focus was on the man, or is on the man, as some are in, even in this message, they're completely missing the God who's invisible. You know, Brother Brown said, you know who I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for him, and until he comes, I'm helpless. But their whole talk was about what the church is going to do, and they're looking for a new wave to begin where the spirit that anointed William Branham is going to come back and anoint them. And I've got news for you. That spirit never left us. He's still here, and it's not about the miracles. It's about the message. And you know what the message is? It's Christ. It's Christ. From an order once at the end time, he said, Now, I want you to be sure 
And you that's listening to this tape, you might have thought today that I was trying to say that about myself, being that I was packing this message. <clears throat> I have no more to do with it than nothing, no more than just a voice, and my voice even against my better judgment. I want to be a trapper, but it's the will of my father that I declare to do and am determined to do. I wasn't the one that appeared down on the river. I was only standing there when he appeared. I'm not the one that performs these things and foretells these things that happens as perfect as they are. I'm only one that's near when he does it. I was only a voice that he used to say it. It wasn't what I knew. It's what I just surrendered myself to that he spoke through. It isn't me. It wasn't the seventh angel. Oh, no. It was a manifestation of the Son of Man. It wasn't the angel, his message. It was the mystery that God unfolded. It's not a man. It's God. The angel was not the Son of Man. He was a messenger from the Son of Man. The Son of Man is Christ. He's the one you're feeding on. You're not feeding on a man, a man whose words will fail, but you're feeding on the unfailing body word of the Son of Man. And if you haven't fed fully on every word to give yourself strength to fly over all of these denominations, things of the world, will you at this time do it while we pray? Remember, he said, my ministry is to declare that he's here. To declare him. That's one thing. Godhead. Understanding. Relationship. And that he's here. It's not about the miracles. The miracles was used as the wrappings on the loaf to attract your attention to a message. Now, I know Brother Bram said that, you know, when Pentecost or the, when the world begins to come for this message, it's over. And I know that's what Brother Derek was trying to point out. Hey, they're coming now. And they are, but you know, they're doing what the people in the message have done for years. They're not coming for the message. They're coming for the ministry or they're coming for the miracles. Two million people that followed Moses didn't pay attention to his message. They followed the miracles and they perished. <clears throat> From events made clear by prophecy, the Pharisees looked back to see what Moses said and they said, We have Moses, we don't need, we don't know where, whence thou comest. But remember, when Moses was here, they didn't know where he came from either. See? No wonder Jesus said to them, you garnish the tombs of the prophets and you are the ones that put them in there. After their message is gone, the message goes through, the people see it, they make fun of it, the world does. Then after the messenger is finished and the message is done, then they build a denomination upon the message. And they die right there. Never come to life again. Well, listen, the message isn't done until... The bride of Jesus Christ is conformed to that image. Until she's learned to die to herself like the prophet died to himself. But the rest of the world will go on. From one in a million, he said when Israel left Egypt, there was approximately two million people left at the same time. <laughs> Every one of them heard the message of the prophet. Every one of them saw the pillar of fire. Every one of them was baptized to Moses in the Red Sea, every one of them shouted in the spirit, beat the tambourines and run up and down the bank with Miriam when Moses sang in the spirit. They everyone drank from the same spiritual rock. They everyone eat fresh manna every night, every one of them. But there was two that made the land. One out of a million. What was the test? They all drink the same rock. They all eat of the same spiritual manna, tapes, as we're eating this morning, and that the tapes. But the word test proved them. When it come to the time of Kadesh Barnea, when they started over into the promised land and they could not go over till they was tested by the word, and all the other ten came back and they said, we can't make it. The people are, they were like grasshoppers to them. They're, they're great walled cities. The opposition is too great. But Joshua and Caleb stilled the people. They said, we're more than able to take it. Why? Because God said before they left the promised, before they left for the promised land, I've given you the land. I've given it to you. It's yours. But there was one out of a million. <clears throat> From one way provided by God, Brother Brown said, Now God's provided a way, made a way across the Red Sea when they was in a trap. God provided a way, provided them a prophet, provided them a pillar of fire to follow them, a vindication of the word. A man proved of God, that was, uh, that's what he, he said would come to pass, showed them exactly what it was, and yet when they crossed the sea, they wanted law. See, that's not just beings.
That's just the way man operates. He wants to in inject his own ways. Oh, God provided... God's provided way is always the way of sending his word. Now, notice how he said they wanted law so they could have something to inject their own thoughts into. I want you to listen to this. They didn't want to say what the tape said. They didn't want to say what Moses said. They wanted something that they could inject their own thoughts into so they could have something to argue and fuss about. He clarifies this in the sermon, Be, be Not Afraid. As he says that that's exactly what Brother Ryan explains. He says, The biggest mistake Israel ever made when grace had already provided them a prophet, provided them a lamb, and give them the greatest revival they ever had, and was standing on the shores of the Dead Sea, dancing in the Spirit, and singing in the Spirit, and having a jubilee in Exodus 19. They didn't want, want that. They wanted a theology that they could argue about. That's right. All right. And what? They was only about four days away from the Promised Land. The same mistake that our Pentecostal fathers made not so long ago. How little would? <clears throat> you could have told them they was 40 years from the promised land. But they had to get something that they could argue about. And so did our <clears throat> what did God do, do to them? He left them in the wilderness for 40 years. What did they do? Raise crops and children. God blessed them. That's right. And they was great. But one day God said, you've been on this mountain long enough. Let's rise up and go north and take the promise. That's right. When all the old fighters had died, he waited till the old fighters died out. That's true. That's a lot to think about, brother. From the token, he said, if I ain't telling you the truth, they'd never, they'd never speak back. God will never speak to a lie. God speaks to the truth. And these words are testifying that I'm telling you the truth. They are the one that testify of the message that I'm preaching. Not only the angel down there on the river that day that said, your message will fall on the second coming of Christ. The works itself. If you can't believe the angel, uh, that the angel told the truth, believe the works. For the Bible said these things would happen at the end time. They are they, they, are they that testify. They're the ones that speak louder than my words or anything else. It's his word. They testify of the time. <clears throat> now, what are we trying to say? Well, remember when that picture was taken? The Reverend Best, was his name? Wanted to argue with Brother Branham, wanted to debate him. Brother Branham said, I'm not going to debate anybody. They want to fuss, they can fuss. He said, those that believe me, they believe me. Those that don't, they don't have to. So one of the old guys, Brother Bosworth, he said, I'll do it. He was looking forward to it. Brother Bosworth got down there and gave the man so much scripture, the man didn't know where to go. So the man got angry, stuck his fingers right in front of his face, had his cameraman try to take pictures. None of them turned out. See, Brother Ram's way was the best. So then they called Brother Ram to come down. The guy still had some film on the roll. He took pictures. And God left us a legacy. <coughs> you fight the battle, God won't fight it for you. Notice he said, I'm going to go back to that. When all the fighters died, he waited till, till the old fighters died out. <clears throat> From seat shall not be over the shut. Just about six months after I had my first baptism down here on the river, when the light come down right here at the Spring Street, many of you, of you people uh, might want to go down and take a look at, uh, at Spring Street and Water right at the riverfront. And there's where the angel of the Lord appeared in public first, at two o'clock one afternoon and a voice come to uh, come from it and said as john the baptist was sent to forerun the first coming of christ your message will forerun the second coming this is 30 years later and here i am still tonight proclaiming that message and around the world went and went right back to my uh, in, in hometown tonight to to represent this lord jesus christ that i still love with all my heart 
Each day he grows uh, still sweeter than he was the day before. Never, uh, I've never changed one iota in my doctrine. The first thing I started with, I still believe the same thing tonight. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And from birth pains, he says, Oh, word believers, give in to my message. Hear me, not my message, but his message. That he firmly declares to be the truth. You've got to choose from somewhere. You can't sit still after this. You've got to make your choice. So God vindicates that prophet's message with signs and wonders. That it is from him. It was the Lord that descended with a shout, a message. Now in the first Exodus, God backs up his Moses' message with supernatural signs following. From the evening messenger, for the rest of the people who laughed and made fun and would not accept his message, they perished with the rest of the unbelievers. But the unbelievers went out, entered into the uh, but the believers went out and entered into the promised land. They went under the anointed message of the messenger. It was a it was a message of deliverance that God promised he'd bring his people to a land flowing with milk and honey, and it happened because God had already said so, and Moses come and was vindicated as the messenger of that day. Now that brings it pretty plain to us. From Exodus, and we're just about done, uh, from Exodus chapter 3, verse 12, and he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee uh, that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, he shall serve God upon this mountain. And Exodus 4 and 12, Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. From identification, Brother Brown said, And any man with God's message knows where he's standing. He don't care for nobody what they got to say about it. There ain't no bishop or nothing else pushing him around. He knows exactly where he's standing, and that settles it. God vindicates his message and proves that it's right, so he stands right with it, and, and he's fearless. That's the express image of God. That's what Jesus did. He wasn't afraid to say, Oh, you blind Pharisees, you're the ones who build the tombs of the prophets, and you're the ones that put them in there. You are, the, you are your, of your father the devil and the archbishops and everything. He wasn't afraid because he knowed where he was at. You see, there's a difference between standing on that word and fussing. From Second Exodus, God backed up Jesus' message with supernatural signs following. Acts 2 and 22, Ye men of Israel, hear ye these words, Jesus of Nazareth, the man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did in, by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. John 8, 45, And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinces me of sin, or, or accuse me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? John 10, 37, If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is, is in me, and I am. Therefore they sought again to take, up, uh, take him, but he escaped out of their hand. <coughs> and John 14, 11, Believe me that I am in the Father, the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. And it takes us up to the third exodus. God backs up his prophet William Branham's message with supernatural signs to follow. From be not afraid, that so you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, have faith in God. It's all over, brother. Just believe it now. We are strangers to one another. Now that ought to settle it for the whole group of you. Does that confirm that I'm preaching the truth? How would God let me tell something wrong and stand up here with my message? These things are only to indicate a divine and, and a vindication that my theology is right. That's exactly right. Why would God let him time after time after time just exactly, 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 pinpoint, 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 and then not have a pinpoint revelation? That's exactly right. The word of the Lord comes to the prophet. You believe that with all your heart? I don't know you. Jesus knows you. You're a very fine person. And you're not here for yourself. You're here to, uh, for someone else. It's your daughter. You believe God can tell me what her, what her trouble is? It's in her spine. That's true. If, that, if that's right, raise up your hand. Now you believe with all your heart? And from blind Barnabas, is that in, 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 the, in praying for the sick tonight, as we pray for the sick, the Lord may come to us and, and give the visions. And if he does, now remember, the vision does not heal people. The vision is only a vindication that the word is right. Well, if there's 10,000 vindications, 10,000 thus saith the Lord, 10,000 vindications, that's 10,000 vindications that his word is right. How many knows that the word prophet means? Sure you do. A prophet means a, a one who foretells or foretells. And it is a divine sign from God that this person that speaks has the right interpretation of the divine word. Because the word of the Lord came under the prophet, and the prophet foretold and done those signs, which is a vindication that he had the interpretation of the divine word. So I don't care what the church wants to do, what they propose to do, what the man sitting at the table said, claims that Brother Bram told him. 
I believe what the word says. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Father, we want to thank you, Lord, because you have already come <coughs> with vindication. You've already come with signs and wonders, and the people didn't believe that. Why should you do it again? These people think that they're going to they're gonna do it, and then the world, whole world's going to believe, but they didn't believe when your prophet did. So, Father, I just pray that you'd help us not to be looking for those things, but to look for the simple fact that we already have a vindicated word. We already have a vindicated revelation of deliverance. Help us to focus on that. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, the Lord bless thee and keep thee, and may the Lord make his face shine upon thee. <coughs> The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord <coughs> his face shine upon thee and give thee peace and give thee peace. And give thee peace forever. <coughs> the Lord be gracious to you. The Lord make his face shine 